Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna start. If I could, uh, if I could have you find your seat, um, that'd be fantastic. But otherwise, um, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, Aptus, who is a design program partner uh, with Wave. So first of all, thanks to Alex for a great presentation, and thank you to Dave. <laughs> thank you to Dave for. Um, for hosting us, for, for facilitating and, and setting up the meetup. So uh, Aptus, and I'll send, share a little bit of background on Aptus if you're not familiar, um, uh, about what we do as a quote to cash solution provider on the Salesforce platform. Uh, but I also want to dig deep into some of the apps that we're creating, uh, leveraging Wave. Um, so let me just dive in and give you a bit of background on some of the stuff that we're doing. Uh, my name is Elliot Yama, just, just by the way, and uh, what I do is I spend all my time thinking about analytic tools to make users help them make better decisions. So that's, that's what I spend my time doing. And what I've got here is some, this is some of the data that we're doing. I've got a couple data scientists on my team. Um, and you can see here, uh, here's the per capita consumption of cheese in the U.S. And then the number of people who became tangled in their bed sheets. And you can see that there's, there's a real high degree of correlation here. Uh -huh. And um, so this is, you know, this is some stuff that um, you have to kind of dig deep to kind of get into some of this stuff. And here, here we're looking at kind of the honey-producing bee colonies in the U.S. And I don't know if you've been following that, but, but those, their numbers have been dropping. Uh, but at the same time, we can look at kind of how that's correlated to juvenile re re arrests for possession of, of marijuana and you can see that kind of there's there's an inverse correlation and that that too in and of itself is is not significant of anything um, and, then, and then we can also look at the age of Miss America over time right and how that relates to self-inflicted injuries from steam hot vapors and steam baths and you can see that those two are highly correlated the truth is that none of this has anything to do with anything that I want to talk to you about, except for the fact that this is data, right? And uh, we can we can torture data, um, but if you can't take action, then it's really pointless, right? We got a chuckle, and that was great. But uh, so the key then is that we want to help people do something as a result of the insights that they derive, right? Take action from insight, and that really underlies a lot of what we're doing from an app standpoint at Aptus. So let me just give you a little bit of background about Aptis. Aptis started as a contract lifecycle management solution provider built on top of Salesforce nine years ago. And if you, if you know your history, that actually predates the App Exchange. So um, whether it was Locke or, or Prescience, uh, the Aptis founders designed a world-class leading lifecycle management, contract lifecycle management solution built it on Salesforce, and that proved to be actually quite, a, quite a, an insightful move. So today the company's growing rapidly. Our successful customers and in in contracts have said, can you help us actually upstream from the contract? Can you help me get to the contract? Help me, help me produce the quote. And so Aptus has a configure price quote solution that's used by enterprises around the globe. At the same time, customers are saying, help me on the other side of that contract, right? Once I have all that contractual data, I want to be able to do some things with that, right? I want to be able to drive order fulfillment. I want to be able to drive invoicing. I want to drive some of the financial revenue recognition. I want to pay the rebates uh, based on the commitments that I've made to partners or customers. And so uh, Aptus uh, drives all of those processes. And again, all 100% native inside 
Salesforce, the Salesforce platform. We've got renewals, of course, that hangs off of the contracts, and we can take all of this functionality and push it into communities and enable partner commerce and e-commerce. Uh, Aptis also has uh, a fantastic technology that allows all of these Salesforce users to work inside the Microsoft tools that they use in the course of their job, whether it's creating legal contracts or uh, creating spreadsheets for managing pricing, etc. in Excel. And Aptis's X-Author technology connects those users and their tools to Salesforce. It makes those tools behave as if they're part of Salesforce. And so that too is, um, uh, has been a powerful way that we help users. But where I spend all of my time uh, is around something that we call quote to cash intelligence. And that is, it's based on the premise of how do I take this data that's flowing through Aptis and Salesforce and how do I leverage that? How do I provide insights to users to help them make better decisions to drive better business outcomes? And that's what I want to share with you today. I want to share with you some of the things that we're doing from a quote to cash intelligence standpoint. Okay, so I'm going to go at length, I'm going to do a double click on every single one of these <laughs> metrics here. And I'm going to show you examples. I'm not really going to do that because that would take a long time. But I'm sure that, it, uh, I'm sure that we'd learn a lot. Um, but we think about it at a high level, right? So here's some of the stuff that we can track, right? Bookings, revenue, recurring revenue, uh, which is increasingly important in our subscription-based economy. Margin performance, revenue velocity, or the operational component of how we run this business. And when we think about kind of all this stuff, we also can identify those things that put revenue at risk, right? Or that represent risk across these metrics. So there's a pretty rich set of KPIs and measures that we can track. And probably more importantly, is what we can do by making users aware of the data, understand the business performance. And so we can help we can derive insights and provide prescriptive advice to CEOs that help them grow revenue, right? Help them understand how they can bring their quarter into, uh, or, their, or their year into perspective, right? So making choices that actually allow them to reach, to improve goal realization. Same with the C CFO, right? Uh, typically they're looking at forecasts. Can we actually enhance or improve those forecasts? And we can. With the data that flows through Aptis, we actually can do things that go well beyond the purview of what a traditional financial planning analysis team would look at. We can give them early insights, early warning, give them uh, advance notice to some of the things that they need to do to make their, uh, their forecast accurate and to bring that, uh, bring that in. Likewise, sales, right? Uh, so I'll show you some stuff uh, uh, around sales, but we're all familiar with some of the things that... Um, uh, are available to us as individuals from an e-commerce site, uh, e-commerce standpoint. Maybe you go to Amazon, and if you click on a product, you see information that says, hey, people that have looked at this product have also looked at this product. Or people that have bought this have bought it in conjunction with these things. So this notion of a recommender is really fairly prevalent in our lives today. It's not so prevalent in a B2B setting. That will change, right? That is changing as we stand here. Um, but these are some of the things that we can help sales users do, and I'll share some of that with you as well. Marketing, of course, getting the right offer for the, to, to the customer every time. So helping to create the bundle or create the configuration, that basket of items for that user based on things that we understand about that user. So legal operations, again, this is, goes back to kind of uh, legacy aptus, right? Uh, our contract management teams are basically trying to identify and reduce risk, and we can help them do that. And I'll share with you an example uh, of one of the customers, uh, a high-tech customer, and the types of things that they've done inside the WAVE platform using aptus data and intelligence to help reduce risk. Finance, we talked a little bit about that from a forecast accuracy standpoint. And then, of course, um, we can think about contracts from a uh, sell side, right? A, a sell side contract, but we can also think about contracts from a buy side. And in fact, many of your legal organizations don't, don't really distinguish uh, too much in, from that standpoint. They think about both buy side and sell side. But from a supply chain standpoint, 
I want to be able to rationalize the spend that I have on the vendors that produce the best value for me. And so understanding who those are and uh, the types of choices that I might make to improve the financial outcomes, uh, especially for the uh, percent of my spend that is, uh, affects my, um, my direct spend, then, then those are the types of insights that can produce a great deal of value. So how are we doing this? Right? And so we want to think about kind of a, a, a design here or a, a structure that helps us think about the things that we can do with data. So from an active standpoint, we think about descriptive intelligence. Right? So this is just simply what's happened. Right? What's the past? What is my current status? And this is kind of the world of traditional BI, right? This is reporting and charts, dashboards, etc. And if I have access to longitudinal data, right, I can see enough trends, then I can begin to become predictive. So I can actually tell you what's going to happen based on understanding of where you are today, but also what's happened in the past. And if I have those two pieces of information, then it's fairly straightforward for me to become prescriptive. That is, giving a user some guidance or some choices that they might consider. Right? Choices that could help them improve their goal realization or, better yet, um, increase the amount of revenue that they generate. And because we're built on the Salesforce platform, with this type of intelligence, we can actually increase or initiate automation. So we call that cognitive. Right? So I've got uh, an intelligent algorithm, one that can adapt and learn to changes in underlying data, but one that's actually been enabled so that when it produces an outcome, it makes a match, you can actually trigger some type of automation within the platform. Or, if that doesn't feel comfortable, right, that feels a little too, uh, too HAL 9000, then maybe they just alert that user and say, hey, here's a suggestion that you might consider. Just kick off a workflow. Kick off a workflow, exactly. Push this button. <laughs> Making sense? Okay, super. So what I want to do is I want to actually show you a couple of things that we've built and, uh, and share with you kind of how we're beginning to produce predictive, prescriptive cognitive intelligence for users. And I think the key here is Alex touched on this, right? Uh, historically, if you think about kind of that world of BI, it's a world of data scientists. It's a world of exploration. <laughs> And that's an important world, but I think the world's changing, right? And if you think about kind of um, you know folks like Gartner that track these spaces, right? Gartner produced in, in 2014 its Magic Quadrant for Analytics, and it looks at all the BI tools, and there's a lot of them. But it was also an important year because it was the first year that Gartner split that Magic Quadrant report into two, and they dedicated an entire quadrant or uh, choir. Uh, entire publication to advanced analytics. And there they looked at you know, the data science platforms, right? The SASs of the world. And that stuff's really important. To Alex's point, it's not going away. It's producing results. But the world's changing. And so for the average user, the average admin, or the average sales ops, legal ops, right? They want to be able to benefit from the data and the insights that's available to them. So they want packaged applications. They want tools that actually deliver meaningful results to them in a way that they can manage. I don't need to be a data scientist. I don't want to be a data scientist. And I want the type of responsiveness and convenience. Right? <clears throat> the engine in my car is super sophisticated. It's actually controlled by a computer as well. Can I open the hood and make adjustments? I can't, but I sure can drive the car. And there's enough indicators and intelligence for me to make good choices about what the car needs or when it needs service, et cetera. And so I think what I see, what we see at Aptis, is a world that's beginning to move like that, right? Where the type of insights that are available to you about your business can be delivered to you in a way where you don't have to know how to do random forest algorithms, right? This is the world that we live in today. I think you'll begin to see more of these things as we go forward. But let me pause there and uh, see if I can improve on my performances from last week. I'm going to bring up um, I'm going to bring up a mobile application that um, 
that basically provides intelligence. So this is one that we use with an actress. Uh, I've changed the data to protect the innocent, but it's basically looking at the quote to cash funnel. And uh, so let me end this show and see if I can bring up my AirPlay so that I can show you this screen. All right, that should be there. This is not looking good. All right. Why you, why you do that, I think, if anybody wants to drop their card at the end, we're going to uh, hand out some pictures, I'll just take a grab and lay out, we have lots of men, anybody who gives their card, um, we are going to email this presentation, anything that Alex will share with us, we'll send out uh, his email, we'll make sure it clearly takes you to the function about that, and then, um, you know, we're talking about the things that I've had to ask, but it's very important to let everybody know. Larry, because he just gave me this dongle. Magic yeah. is that an appropriate yeah. word to use in public? Um, and so I needed this in uh, in Munich last week. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to open the Salesforce Analytics. Uh, iPhone app, I'm going to open what we call mobile revenue confidence. All right, so I'm now inside this dashboard that uh, the Aptis sales leadership team uses, and you can see, right, so I've got kind of good and handy things, right, I've got my revenue by stage, right, actual forecast plan and variance here, but let's just imagine that we're closing in on towards the end of the quarter, right, I've got 30 days to go, and so I need to make some decisions, and so I need to know what choices are available to me, right? So what's the data? If I'm thinking about, not from a uh, booking standpoint, but from a revenue standpoint, what's the revenue, what are, what, are the, what are the components that I have the most control over? Well, it's my contracts, right? So if I simply bring up a little bit of detail on that, I want to understand what are all those opportunities I currently have in the contract stage? What's their status? And what are some of the things that I might need to highlight to make sure that my team is focused on bringing these things in. And so I've gone into the contract uh, component. You see I've drilled down into the detail and now I'm looking at all the individual contracts by account that are currently in process. And so if I scroll over here, I can see that they're actually sorted by, by revenue. Let me redo that. Right, so I've got some pretty big contracts in here and I can see, you know, they're for new business. But here's an important part, right? And that is we talked about kind of kick off a workflow. Some of, all of these are at a point where they need approval, okay? And so I need to make sure that Sheila is definitely paying attention to the fact that there's a $9 million deal that we need to close this quarter. And, um, and so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take and act, press the actions button here. I'm gonna uh, share a snapshot. I think I want to post that to the uh, the chatter chatter feed, and I'm just going to make sure that she knows that this is the one that I'm thinking about. In fact, I want to do this because I don't really want to share with her all the other stuff. So I'm just going to kind of frame that out. I've got this, and I can post it, and I can say, Sheila, you know, go go go, right? I mean, she knows what that is because we speak in code, but. Um, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so this is the kind of stuff that, uh, like Alex said, it's, it's in your pocket, right? You can manage your business. In fact, there was, um, uh, at the Salesforce World Tour in Munich last week, we sat through a presentation uh, by the leader of Coca-Cola's Germany unit, the fastest growing unit in that entire organization. And he said, uh, he said, it's... Danger, the most dangerous place to make a decision is in the office because it's the place that you're actually the least connected to the customer. And so I thought it was an interesting comment simply because in the past you had to make all your decisions in the office, right? Because that's where all the information was. That's where all your systems were. But he was basically talking about how he operates in a mobile world, a world where he has data on his, on his phone and he actually can run his business from his pocket, essentially. All right, so that's the one I wanted to share with you there. Um, so let me bump back out of this. Thank you so much. Do you have? Uh, do you sell these? 
<laughs> I can start the business in San Francisco. <laughs> cool. All right, so now what I'm going to do is I've got two different wave instances. And I don't know if I'm... So a year ago, we got invited into a Pioneers program, and we got an early access to WAVE. So we've been working on WAVE um, for, uh, for since that time. And then more recently, we were invited into a, a design program for ISVs. And so the lab that Alex mentioned is super cool. There's drinks and snacks and... <laughs> <laughs> I'm teasing. There is actually, it really is as he described. Um, we've been able to get access to experts that can help us answer questions that we've been wrestling with and we can make progress. Um, so I'm not seeing this thing come up and that's... It's on the Apple Watch. Sorry? Is it on the Apple Watch? Not on my Apple Watch. Um, <laughs> All right. Anybody got any suggestions about what I might do here? Flux capacitor. Flux capacitor. I'm not trying to travel time. That's your uh, problem. Function F7? Yeah. F7? Uh, it's connected fine. I think you're just not displaying it. Yeah. Maybe function F7. All right. <coughs> Presentation. Maybe F8. There we go. Right. So let's do this. <laughs> 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 Ace <laughs> Three right. billion dollars? Oh my goodness. Let's see. So what I want to do, I'll make this so it's a little bit easier to see. Alright, so this is this is an application built on Wave. And um, has everybody seen kind of the desktop version of Wave before? Anybody not seen desktop version of Wave? All right, so let me let me give you the nickel tour. All right, so um, basically you're inside of this is this will be helpful to illustrate a couple of points that you made, Alex. All right, so this is kind of the home page within within Wave. Right, each one of these is a data set. Right, any source of structured or semi-structured data. Right, the data I'm using is all derived from uh, Aptus instances that, that sit in Salesforce orgs. Right? Once I have that data set, I then decide how I want to um, basically begin to look at that data through a lens. And from there, from the lens, I can begin to kind of build dashboards. I can package those dashboards and make apps. Okay? And then I can decide, decide who's, who they're available to, who can, who can see them. Right? So I'm looking, at, um, I'm looking at an app that I've created called Quote to Cache Intelligence. And again, kind of as I think about kind of some of the things that um, are important for the senior executives who use this app. They want to understand where we are from a booking standpoint. So they're looking at kind of actual performance relative to forecast and the annual plan. And it's really helpful to make it simple for them to understand where do we stand in terms of the gap to goal. Right? We also can look at revenue, right? So this is more the financial definition of revenue. So it includes sales bookings, but it also includes that those uh, those monies, those sums that are actually under contract, as well as those things that are invoiced. And then I can also make a projection about my margin performance. Now all of this information is essentially faceted, right? It has meaning I can drill into various dimensions and the information dynamically updates, right? So if you're a Salesforce user and you're familiar with kind of standard reporting and dashboards, you can't do what I just showed you. Right? Not, not easily, not without a lot of repetition. Right? So that's one of the really exciting things about it. But here's another thing that's pretty exciting, and that is I can look at um, where I stand in the quarter, right? projecting forward for this quarter, and I can track all the deals that have been committed by the sales team. But Aptis has actually looked at the past, and so it's it's actually making its own estimation of what's actually going to come in. And so it's saying, this is what's expected. I understand that you're saying this is what's the total value of committed, but this is actually what's more realistic based on past performance. And you might say, well, that's kind of handy, but what's the delta, right? What's, what's apt is kicking out? Well, I've got some of that data right here. It's actually showing me the deals as well as a reason for why each one of them has been eliminated. And you can see that 
you probably can't see. Uh, it's too small and too blurry. But um, margin, right? So some you have a number of these that are pending margin approval, and they may just be so far out that in their current configuration, they're not coming in. But the other thing that factors in here, remember that when we talk about meeting a, a bookings goal, it's not just uh, making the sale, it's actually having the contract, right? The contract is the way that that's, that's the final closure for winning that deal. And in most organizations, there's a process of approvals around that contract and then ultimately signatures. And so one of the things that we can help folks understand, let me drill into this a bit more, um, is that approval process as well as the risks associated with the deals that we're tracking. So this is a risk dashboard, right? So this is a double click into those, into the risk components of those deals that have been um, discounted. So the first thing I look at is of all those sales agreements that I'm tracking, right? I have a number that are essentially without risk or the risks they contain are considered kind of standard, acceptable risks. Whereas there's others, right, 608, that actually have material risk. This is risk that we need to actively manage. Right? And you can see here the dollar, or money amounts, right, the dollar amounts of, of those two categories. And those, so there's some pretty significant uh, financial exposure related to the risks in those sales agreements. This, and let me, let me just try to make this a little bit bigger so that you can, so it's not me just, uh, is that better? So what are the types of things that connote risk with, inside a sales agreement? Well, it might be the types of commitments that you make, right? Maybe I'm delivering, I'm making an agreement where it says I'm going to deliver technology ahead of my roadmap, right? Or maybe I'm delivering technology that actually is restricted uh, by the government. I can't actually ship this to this country, right? There's export controls. Or there's risk of, of it actually slipping over a border. Right? Maybe there's something around limitation of liability or margin or payment terms, right? So some type of contractual agreement. So I can understand, this helps me understand uh, the total number of instances that those show up. I can also, from an operational standpoint, I want to know, do I have the right people spending the right amount of time on the right things? And this chart helps me understand, am I dealing with uh, a one-off instance? And if it is a one-off instance of risk, is this a big, big deal on a big, big customer who actually would have the leverage that would force me to accept this? Or am I dealing with kind of uh, kind of call it egregious risks on really small deals, right? Things that I really shouldn't be exposed to. So this is to help me understand that. Now, every time there's a risk component, there's typically an approval process, right? This has to be run by a certain, certain levels or certain elements of the organization, and I want to understand that piece as well. And so here, I have a visual depiction of the cycle time for risk approval and I can see it from an end-to-end -end standpoint, I can also drill in. And this helps me then, from, from, the, from that perspective, I can begin to use this as a tool to drive organizational performance as well as individual performance. Because right? there might be one particular individual who's routinely slow at actually making the approvals, and this can help me call that out. From there, we talk about automation, right? I could actually set an action. I could ping that person, but we assume that they kind of already know that they're slow. So maybe I need to ping that person's manager. Right? So these are some of the things that we can do from an organizational standpoint based on the data that we, uh, that we can derive and the type of intelligence that we can see. Make sense? So another piece here as we think about kind of those contracts is giving our sales team heads up around some of the events that are in the time horizon or on the horizon for the customers that they manage. Right? So here's just simply kind of the renewal horizon, 30, 60, 90 days, right? Looking at the different types of um, agreements that we track. And probably more importantly, I have those expiring agreements. And again, with the type of data and detail that I have, I can actually give that salesperson an alert so that they can start a conversation. And probably more importantly, I might even think of that, uh, that expiring uh, contract as an opportunity for renewal, but also an opportunity for upsell. So I want to share with you something around that as well. 
Let me uh, let me just pause here though. Is this making sense? Questions? Comments? How are you classifying risk? That was what I was a little bit left behind on. Yeah, sure, sure. Risk of not closing or the risk of taking a bad deal? Both are important. Okay. The way one business might define risk could be different than the way another business could define risk. But when you think about uh, a forecast, right, there's a risk of not closing the deal, but there's also a risk of not closing the deal in time. Okay. And so both of those elements can be material. Okay. Yeah. You talked earlier about predictive analytics. Yeah. What kind of predictive analytics do you have using Wave or without this? So, when you say what kind, I mean, what, what types of formulas do we use? Or? No, I mean, if you're looking at what's expiring, is that what you call predictive or you're looking at predictive as? Sure, sure, sure. So, uh, I guess, the, think of it this way, right? We're trying to solve business problems with data. And I don't always need to use a random forest algorithm to solve every business problem. So, sometimes it's just simply understanding what's happening. Sometimes it might be saying what's happening in the future, which is essentially predictive. Right? Um, I'm going to show you some things that are probably more sophisticated from a computational standpoint, right? but um, I don't think in, in that regard, we don't really, we're not trying to be the most sophisticated analytics application company, we're trying to be the most effective, or among the most effective. Was there another hand? So let me show you some of the other things <coughs> that we're doing. So, what I've done here is I've jumped to a new browser, and I'm actually in Aptus uh, CPQ. Okay, and what I've got is I've started a quote for a customer. Uh, my customer is called Tier 1, so let me just bring that up. Let me make a little bit more screen real estate. So here I am. You can see that I'm in, I've got my quote. It's, it's number 3, and I've got a bunch of the kind of quote detail here, right, standard good stuff. But what I want to do is I want to add some additional products. Right? So I'm going to click this button, Configure Products. And, the, and what that's going to do is it's going to bring me into the CPQ shopping cart, where I'll actually see additional products that I can add. Of course, I can price this quote. And then I can finalize the quote and send it on to the customer, right? which of course then would start the whole process. Once they accept it, we'd start the contracting process. So, one of the things you can see is that I've got the A1 Contacts Edition product in here, and I want to add some more. Now, I could just simply click this button and say, add more products, and it would take me into the catalog, and I could kind of navigate that hierarchy. But what I can do alternatively is I can press this button here, which is Recommend Products. And what's going to happen is I'm going to get this screen that's going to generate a list of products that's based on a comparison of Tier 1, my customer Tier 1, the product that's already in the uh, shopping cart, but also the assets that they own. And so I've got an algorithm that's running in the back that's actually going to compare Tier 1 to all the other customers that I have and all the assets that they own. And based on that assessment, I'm getting this list of recommended products. Okay, and so these look good, right? I can see that they have good ratings. I can add any one of them to the cart, but I might want to understand as a sales user, I might want to say, why? Why have these been recommended for me? Or for this, for Tier 1? So I can click this, um, this button that says Explanation. And what I'm going to get here is actually a feed of information right from Wave, right, that's giving me... Uh, a bit of an asset profile for this customer, right? The penetration rate for each one of these products is being recommended, right? So I can see essentially kind of why these are recommended for this particular customer, right? So I can go back here and, um, and I can add these to the cart, right? And then I can go ahead and process this. I can price this out and push this to my customer, right? So again, from, from, from our standpoint as individuals, we're pretty comfortable with this type of technology. Right? We get exposed to it and the things that we shop for. But from a business to business standpoint, having this type of information makes the sales user much more consultative in their interaction with the customer. Right? So this particular one is around uh, these affinity products. We could also take the same approach to say, if this is a configurable product, 
right? A1 is a configurable product. I could actually recommend the other elements that should be attached to configure this completely. Right? So I can make a recommendation around that bundle, essentially. Let me pause there. Questions or comments around that? Let me ask you this. Are any of you in your businesses using recommenders today? Mm. Kind of? Yes? You guys in the same business? No? You guys do business through e-commerce platforms? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, where, that's where I see a lot of the traction today. What types of things do you sell? Services or you sell actual uh, tangible items? No, more like services, yeah. yeah. And you? Amazon. Amazon, yeah. There's a few recommenders there. Uh, <laughs> you might actually argue that uh, the future of e-commerce is recommenders, right? It's just, it's, if you ever diagnose the typical Amazon UI, I mean, there's a little bit of product information, and there's a little bit of cart functionality, and all the rest is a series of recommenders. Yeah, it's the way that information will be served to us. Yeah, in the back. So, uh, how are the recommended products being cluttered out, so to speak? Is it because, um, I know you showed here, one of the screens was saying, like, customers or companies like you also have these products? Sure. So that would mean that it's, you know, it has some information on the back end about it the rest of the customer base. Uh, is that the only place you're getting the data? Are you collecting data as different transactions go through and adding that to the intelligence, or what's happening? Yeah, sure. So to answer the last question first, <coughs> definitely, right? I mean, the more information that you can pull in about what, what's, what the response is, right, the behavioral response, the more accurate those recommendations become. Uh, in terms of, is that the only thing that we look at? That's the only thing we're looking at in this particular demo instance, but uh, adding additional data sources or combining other data into there is is relatively straightforward. Greg, is there anything you you're the guy that uh, essentially built that? Is there anything that you'd add around around that response? No, I mean you can tell him like what the algorithm is and stuff. And you? Data. It's uh, the guy who actually developed the algorithm for this. Came here as neighbor algorithm, and it actually looks at how similar one customer is to another, and based on what product that customer ordered, mm -hmm. it is able to recommend the top five products in this case. So it's a very similar to like an Amazon item-based collaboration uh, model. That's one way to approach it. Again, we don't necessarily say there's only one right way. I mean, if you think about kind of the data scientist, they have a a library of tools and they apply those tools to, to kind of make the most effective outcomes and basically what we look to do is kind of enable those through the application itself. Yeah, please. Well, I think consumer sales versus B2B sales is quite different. And when you're a buyer, you're suggesting some product that similar customers already bought. And sure. that's a good feature. <coughs> And for a salesperson, especially B two B sales, uh, a suggested list of products may or may not help you to complete the current sales. And second, um, usually those sales reps are very conservative. They want to make sure they know the reason behind the suggestion. And especially if you can add a percentage, like what's the, the possibility and what's the reason behind it, that may help you. But I don't think it's at the shopping cart. It's more like at the very beginning, um, when you approach the customer, what's the prospect, or what kind of like, product portfolio you want to offer to the customer. Not how it works. And, and I think um, K-Mean is not a good, algorithm to suggest a product. No, it's K. Oh, sorry, sorry. It's not a cluster. Okay. So, uh, so I think uh, I think your statements are fair in that uh, it really depends on the business. Um, 
But let me ask you this. When you say it's not relevant to show a salesperson what other customers have bought, but what if it's what the customers of the two or three best salespeople in the company bought, right? Now I can think about this as a tool that actually enhances individual performance, raises the performance of all my sales reps to become more like the behavior of my best reps, and of course over time, maybe the identities of those best reps change or those practices change, but my model is learning and adapting, and so I'm always trying to drive people to do the thing that is most relevant in the marketplace today. Other questions or comments? So let me throw this out there as well to you guys. Um, one of the things that I'm particularly interested in is ideas, right? Your ideas. And especially your ideas for how we might use data. Um, I'm going to give up trying to project this. <laughs> I can't find the button. I can't talk at the same time. So if you've got ideas about how we might use data to enhance a user's ability to perform within the quote to cash process, if you've got ideas like that, then I'm all ears. And I want to hear them. And we'd add them to the list of other great ideas that we've got. And we draw one of those uh, each month. Uh, between now and Dreamforce, so September 15th, and the winner, uh, the one that's drawn then wins an Apple uh, Apple Watch from, from Aptus. So um, this is my email address, so if you've got an idea and you want to send it in, um, just go ahead and email me, and I'll, uh, I'd probably want to engage you and have a little bit of a conversation just so I understand, but that's, that's the kind of stuff that we're interested to know. Right? What is it that you're thinking about? What is it that you see? Are you trying to solve uh, problems that relate to quote to cash in your business with data? And is there a way that we can help you with that? Maria, I think we've reached the end of my presentation. And I'm really... I just think it's funny, like people will fill in all these things for different prizes and like here it's like a pretty good chance like you just go to one of these a couple of times and like you're pretty proud to win. Proud to win plus get pizza, a couple beers, right? I mean it's a win win win. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Yeah, you're gonna, I'm going to let you pick. Should we throw them up in the Should air? Have Alex, Alex, I think you were oh, like no. the special guest you pick. Get, just get in there, pick out the best one. Find the smartest person in here. <laughs> this guy, yeah, this, I think you were right. I was thinking the same. Uh, and it probably right to look. I think this is a female's name. Um, Carrie uh, McMahon? Excellent. Yeah, it is the smartest person in here. <laughs> Do you have any other comments or updates on when the next event is? Uh, next, uh, thanks everyone for coming. Thanks to Aptus Thank and you. Elliot and Alex. It's great. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Thank thanks, you. Alex.